and we actually can begin to look at um, these kind of chemicals that we interact with on a daily basis in the city. So, uh, in particular, I'll be focusing on nitrogen dioxide, ozone, and particulate matter, which are our, which are all regulated uh, by the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. Um, and the reason why we focus on these pollutants is because they're actually hazardous to human health. So these pollutants affect our lung health. Um, they can cause asthma. Um, they affect our heart health. Uh, exposure to the, these pollutants are associated with higher uh, cardiovascular diseases. Um, and then it also affects our brain health even. Um, we've seen some studies come out about um, Alzheimer's and connections with pollutants. So uh, we study these things because it's really important for um, the people who live in the city and interact with uh, these pollutants that are just going to be always around us. Um, so in Chicago, we actually do monitor uh, these pollutants. Uh, I have the outline of Cook County here, um, and I've got uh, some sensors. We've got particulate monitors, uh, we've got ozone monitors, and we've also got nitrogen dioxide monitors. Uh, and these pollutants are kind of all around the city. Uh, but what we actually also can look at is things like um, related uh, health outcomes. So on the right hand panel, I have a map of child asthma hospitalizations over the city of Chicago. Um, and these sensors are great for the purpose that they're put out for, which is to um, basically monitor ambient air pollution levels. So kind of like what's in the background, what in general are, are is the general uh, Chicago population being exposed to. Uh, but what we've also seen is what what does it mean uh, when we uh, what does it mean on a finer scale? Uh, this is our average exposures that we have from the EPA sensor placements, but we also then begin to see that there we have these um, related health negative health outcomes that aren't really being monitored by just these EPA sensors. Uh, so then I come in with the question: with how do we figure out what's happening with Chicago air pollution in areas? that we're not even monitoring. Um, and for me, the way that I approach this is uh, I look at Chicago air quality through a variety of data sets, not only the EPA sensors, which are found around the city, uh, but I also look, use satellite observations. So we've got geo-orbiting satellites that take snapshots of continuous air quality maps um, every single day. Uh, and then we've also got tools like numerical modeling. I use a chemical transport model, which I'll get into later, uh, but there are other kinds of numerical models or statistical models that people use in order to really figure out what's happening in between these sensors. Like what is happening on the ground at a more neighborhood scale analysis. Um, so yeah, for this study in particular, uh, we focused on our air pollution modeling. So if we go back to the to the kind of um, you know raw raw materials necessary in order to figure out what's happening with air pollution, uh, we have information on emissions and we have information on meteorology. So for emissions, we know how many cars are around. We've got um, We've got uh, monitors on uh, power plants in order to tell us what the chemical output of these power plants are. Uh, we've got, you know, um, our average rates of using these um, different kind of personal care products, and we know in general how many trees there are. So we have this gridded data set as our emissions coming in, uh, and then we apply what we know about physics and chemistry uh, and put them all together on this map. And in a less conceptual framework, uh, what we did for this air pollution modeling uh, is we modified the 2014 um, National Emissions Inventory using the sparse matrix operating kernel of emissions, which basically took the, this gridded emissions data set and then put it on our unique um, our, our unique grid that is at about one kilometer squared. So we actually get to see these like neighborhood scale changes in air quality. Um, and for this study, we only simulated two months due to computational constraints, uh, but we chose one representative summer month, uh, August, and one representative winter month of January um, in order to figure out what's happening as far as seasonality goes. Um, and then we put in these emissions into a two-way wharf CMAC uh, simulation, which is basically a chemical transport model that allows communication between uh, the chemistry and the meteorology that's being simulated. Uh, so they can go back and forth and decide what's happening within our atmosphere. 
Um, and that's all to say that we take what we know and we try to make a state of the science estimation of what's happening within our atmosphere. And here's the output. This is actually what the modeling output looks like. We get hour by hour data on a geospatially continuous domain at 1.3 kilometers. Um, and here I have uh, the EPA sensors highlighted and they're also shaded by what color um, they're, they're uh, registering at that hour. Um, and you can see the fact that uh, like from the EPA data, you don't get as much like interesting plume information. You don't get to see the way that the highways light up. Uh, you can see how truly amazing this tool is in order to uh, identify what's happening within our atmosphere. And again, this is taking, this is a huge computational effort, but it's providing us some really amazing insights about what's happening within our atmosphere. Um, so yeah, uh, stopping the movie and creating a monthly average, we can then begin to look at um, the modeling output that we have. And here I've highlighted nitrogen dioxide, ozone, and particulate matter. Uh, and then also on the top row, we've got the summer months, and on the bottom row, we've got the winter months. And uh, I didn't make these uh, color, these uh, scales the same across both of these, um, because I just wanted to highlight the spatial patterns um, of the pollution that happens across these months. In general, we see lower, lower amounts of pollution in winter than in summer, but not always because particulate matter is actually higher in the winter time. Um, but given these maps, we can begin to identify what is happening with pollution within the city. What, what, what kind of spatial patterns do we see? Um, and when you're looking at nitrogen dioxide and ozone, this is clearly, clearly a story about the highways in Chicago. Uh, nitrogen dioxide, both in uh, August and January, you see the fact that the, uh, that the highways really light up um, and you see this high concentration of nitrogen dioxide. And in particular, there is a high concentration in the loop, which makes sense. A lot of the highways are heading towards the center of the city. You can then also look at the ozone maps. And from that, we actually get an inverse uh, picture of what's happening with nitrogen dioxide. What you see with ozone is that we actually see uh, depleted levels of ozone where there's higher levels of nitrogen dioxide. And that simply goes back to the way that ozone and nitrogen dioxide are related. In fact, nitrogen dioxide is a, uh, is a component that you put in in order to create ozone. Uh, and these have a highly nonlinear relationship and they kind of act really weird in the system given the relative amounts of nitrogen dioxide and volatile organic compounds, the VOCs that I have here, uh, they'll either create or destroy ozone. And what you can see is because these highways are su have such high levels of nitrogen dioxide, on average, it's, it's actually destroying more ozone over these uh, highways. But in other parts of the city where you see lower levels of nitrogen dioxide, you see these elevated levels of ozone. Mm -hmm. So from just this relationship, it's really interesting to see what's happening to the city of Chicago on a neighborhood scale with these two photochemicals. But then we can also look at something like uh, particulate matter, uh, where we're actually seeing these hot spots in the loop and in midway, but not so much in other places. It's a little bit more of a, a straighter gradient, even though it's certainly elevated over this highway. Um, and that's because uh, particulate matter, it's not only coming out just directly like nitrogen dioxide, but it also uh, is formed through secondary reactions. So kind of in the same way that ozone is formed in our environment, particulate matter can actually also react with other things and be formed in our environment. Um, so yeah, this is our, our maps of air quality that we use to um, enter into our COVID-19 analysis. And that's because when we're looking at these maps of Chicago, uh, it's really important to, to consider like who is actually living here, who is actually uh, interacting with these hotspots. We need to put them in context and, and figure out what connections do the, does the environment have with the people who live in it. Um, I've, I've always come to these kinds of analyses with, uh, you know, very much a, a chemistry kind of background, uh, but then that's why we have people like Molly to help out uh, put these into context, because obviously these, um, these maps are 
are also indicative of the kind of negative health outcomes that are associated with elevated levels of pollutants. Uh, and in particular, when we're looking at something that's so geospatially uh, located, such as uh, these polluting hotspots, we also have to think about our city as it is and the way that it's a really highly segregated city. So um, these kind of negative health outcomes will also therefore uh, result in um, these disparate health outcomes across racial lines uh, in the city of Chicago. Um, so yeah, when we're thinking about the link between COVID and air quality, we both know that you know health and pollution are related. Um, and in some ways we're trying to figure out is, I mean, COVID-19 obviously affects kind of similar, uh, similar um, functions that pollution does. Uh, so is that actually being worsened by pollution or is it not? Um, so that's that's one way that we took these maps and applied it to this study. Um, and here I have uh, the link of our two maps. We've got nitrogen dioxide and then we've also got the um, the early death rate of COVID across the city. Um, sorry? Sorry, I had to jump off for a second, Stacey. When I jumped back on, it was like recording in progress. You please, please go ahead. Oh. <laughs> no problem. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. Just to so we take these um, this neighborhood scale analysis and then um, of of air quality, and then we actually put it in as inputs in order to uh, compare uh, census tract information to this air quality as an input and not to get in the way of Molly's punchline, but to finish up this air quality section, it's actually we actually see that social factors are more linked to fatality than this air quality exposure, um, which is a little bit different than what other studies have found. Uh, but, you know, this is a, a, a vastly like changing field in air quality, and we're using a completely novel data set. So um, I'll hand it over to Molly now to uh, talk about the rest of our study. Great. Um, I'll just share my screen over here. Um, good. Um, so thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, thank you to Marinia for putting this together. I am Molly Scan O'Brien. I'm an epidemiologist, and this has been a very weird year to be an epidemiologist. Um, I'm based out of the University of Illinois at Chicago, where I'm a research assistant professor um, at the Institute for Minority Health Research. My work largely um, focuses on health disparities. Um, and in this work, as Stacey was introducing, we examine air quality and COVID-19 mortality during what we now know is the first wave of the virus as it came across Chicago. So um, it was through a kind of chance meeting in a group very much like this one that Stacy and I met pre-pandemic um, when uh, we and when we at UIC were looking for ways to explore the role of environment um, and the risk from COVID. Um, she and Dan were able to share these models with us, and I do fully admit that we are underutilizing these models, um, almost insulting to their very fine temporal resolution. What we were essentially looking for was an almost static indicator for our long-term air quality at a particular location. Um, but as I'll get into, what we really needed was the spatial resolution of these models. So um, happily, Stacy and Dan were not too insulted. Um, we used these data and we ended up with some, some pretty meaningful findings. So during this talk, what I'll focus on is the geospatial component of what we did with an eye to air quality, but there's a link at the end again to that larger article that got published last November. So like everyone else this spring, I was pretty horrified as we watched COVID begin to erupt. Um, most of the early identified risk factors for dying of COVID were clinical. There are things like age, um, pre-existing morbidities, obesity, but really the only tool we had to avoid getting sick in the first place was prevention. And this led to widespread stay at home orders, encouraging of social distancing and the really broad disruption that came with that. As the pandemic progressed, it became abundantly clear in the United States that COVID was not just killing people with a set of pre-existing risk factors. This is one of the last data updates from the now mothball COVID tracking project, but just doing a gross comparison of the death rates over the whole United States, it becomes pretty clear that almost all non-white, non-Asian Americans were getting sick and dying at a disproportionate rate. And some of this is explained by what communities are unable to socially distance, 
Some of it's explained by the um, higher rate of clinical risk factors in these populations um, that might put you at a higher risk of mortality, although both of those explanations do sort of beg the follow-up question about what structural forces created the environment where non-white Americans were at such high risk. Um, but while those did explain some of the disparity, it didn't explain all of it. Um, so it made sense to us at this point to start to look at factors in the environment and more specifically air quality. Um, and this is plausible. Um, the places where there was high COVID mortality in the beginning of the pandemic seemed also to be places uh, with poor air quality. Um, we also know just from you know, living <laughs> and also research that non-white populations are disproportionately exposed to poor air quality. So um, also COVID kind of obviously is a pulmonary disease um, and poor air quality puts you at risk for a whole host of other pulmonary diseases. So there were a lot of sort of reasons to, to want to look here and that was our motivation. Um, and of the many constituent particles of air pollution in the United States, the link with pulmonary disease is strong for a handful, um, particularly ozone, nitrogen dioxide and particulate matter less than 2.5 microns. And somewhat compellingly, the same risk profile that describes patients who are at greater risk of COVID-19 mortality if you inquire the infection, um, that was sort of the same risk profile of people who seem to be more susceptible to air pollution in other pulmonary diseases. Um, there are also, uh, for, in terms of mechanisms, there are obviously outstanding questions, but the proposed mechanisms also sort of held water. Um, there were some studies suggesting that maybe the virus could survive longer in polluted air. Um, that evidence is still emerging and mostly came from areas of China where levels of uh, smog is higher than what's usually seen in the United States. Um, but most of the focus has been on the changes that air pollution induces in those who breathe it. Um, so poor air quality could very plausibly make an individual more susceptible to the virus. Um, it could damage your lungs or your mucous membranes, which would make it easier for the virus to infect you. Um, it could make an infected individual more likely to experience complications, um, either because of their weakened lungs or because of the systemic inflammation um, that air pollution can induce in people and could lead to these uh, immune system freakouts that actually killed a lot of people. Um, so pretty early on, this preprint came out. It's a well-respected group and they did the work pretty well and they should be lauded for working really quickly to see, to, to start to look at this. Um, back in April, which is crazy, which means they like started the analysis on this like before it was declared an endemic or a pandemic by the WHO, um, they came out with this preprint that looked county by county, so 3,000, there's roughly 3,000 counties in the United States, to see if county level air pollution was associated with county level mortality, and it was. Um, and Google Scholar now estimates that this has been cited more than 700 times. It got a ton of press. Um, and so I talked to the authors of the study. They're very nice and they're very smart. Um, and um, they were being as methodical as they, they could at the time. This is sort of like a story of science, right? Like there's a reason why you, you continue to do the research, right? Like if you knew the answer about whether air pollution, you know, kills you from COVID, then you wouldn't bother to do the research. But you look for like the first level of hypothesis and then you sort of keep on pushing. Um, the study was pretty quickly followed by several others. There's one in Italy, there's one in Holland, there's one in the UK that all use the same sort of ecological study design um, using geographic units that are roughly equivalent or larger to counties in the United States. Um, it's worth noting that by the time this paper made its way through peer review, the conclusions were like massively tempered and the authors present lessons learned about sort of how to approach and interpret these kind of large area estimates. Um, we had some concerns with the county level analysis, um, and these concerns sort of fell in two buckets. And the first was this spatial resolution, um, and this is where the air quality data really was, was necessary. We knew that county level estimates were going to obscure really large differences in exposure, like that's for sure, you saw that from Stacey's maps. Um, but also staying at the county level would homogenize some real variation in the outcome, like the clusters of COVID-19 and the clusters of the mortality. Every news organization from Block Club to the Tribune has a neighborhood level map and it's pretty obvious that the disease did not hit the city uh, in the same way everywhere. Um, the second bucket of concern had to do with correlation between other risk factors in COVID, both temporally and spatially. So um, what I mean by temporally, it sort of refers to that spread of COVID during the first, first wave. In the spring, it was largely concentrated in urban areas. So if an urban area just happens to have a lot of COVID and an urban area just happens to have a lot of air pollution, there is a lot of potential for spurious associations. 
But spatially, it was a concern too, because air pollution is not randomly distributed in the city. Um, it's overlaid with a lot of other things that could just as plausibly increase your risk for COVID. Um, and a word, and I've seen this in the chat, you guys are all familiar with this, this term of the built environment, um, which is roughly neighborhood factors. Um, and there's a nice narrative equally good for what we, we had for the plausibility of air quality mattering for, for the built environment mattering. Um, they could matter directly through like your exposure to air pollution or something like that. Uh, also, like if your neighborhood had a whole bunch of people who vacationed in the Alps for spring break last year and they all came back, like there's a lot of reasons that your surrounding could put you at higher risk for infection. Um, but there's also, or more mortality of infected, but there's also indirect effects of neighborhood. Um, if you live in a place that's underserved for food or healthcare, um, it might be harder for you to maintain a baseline level of health um, than it would be if there was additional infrastructure in your neighborhood. Um, and there's also indicators of neighborhoods that are proxies for other things, and most prominently of that would probably be the race of your neighborhood. Um, we have every reason to suspect from our understanding of a lot of other health outcomes that the inequalities that are associated with living in a majority minority community um, and these inequalities that persist after controlling for other factors may still affect your risk for COVID. Um, in this case, it's not biological race, but the lived experience of racism here that would be the hypothesized uh, culprit. Um, the problem with, with dealing with pretty much anything having to do with the neighborhood or pretty much anything spatial, um, we came up with 33 of them, and I'll get into the details of that in the next slide, the uh, ways that you can describe a neighborhood that we have some sort of plausible connection, well, one, we had data on, and two, that could have some plausible connection to COVID mortality, um, but they're all like horrifically correlated, and this is a heat map of the, the correlation coefficients of, of these variables with highlighted in black the, the air quality measures. Um, so you really need to take that correlation into, into, um, into consideration when you're dealing with anything uh, like this. So armed with that background, um, we did decide to look at air pollution and COVID mortality within the city limits of Chicago specifically to see if the more fine spatial resolution added additional context to these county level analyses that we were seeing and it like absolutely did. <laughs> um, here are the daily um, death counts through the summer where we, and you're all here, uh, except I see some of you are from New York, but you have a different story to tell there too. Um, There's pretty substantial community spread with hospitalizations and deaths that didn't really tamp down until the beginning of the summer. Um, so we did want to test out this totally reasonable hypothesis that pollution might be causally related, although causally is a funny word to use, it might be related to COVID mortality disparities. Um, so the analysis that we did is as follows. So we took the outcome measure and it was deaths from COVID-19 to residents of the city of Chicago from the Cook County Medical Examiner. And we looked through July 15th. Um, that was sort of corresponded to the end of this, this first wave, depending on how you want to do those thresholds. We geocoded the residents of each death, assigned them to a census tract, and then we excluded those that occurred within nursing homes and this, also the deaths that occurred in the Cook County Jail. Um, the air quality measures were as provided by Dan and Stacy. Um, and of note, the areas with high levels of pollution, particularly nitrogen dioxide and PM 2.5, were areas that were predominantly non-white. Um, we also controlled for these other neighborhood characteristics that are on the right-hand side here that um, to reduce the threat of these associations with air pollution be due to spurious associations with these other risk factors. Um, the way that we picked these 33 variables was, again, data availability because necessity is the mother of invention. Um, and the vast majority of these came from either the Chicago Health Atlas or the American Community Survey. Um, we, can, we were looking for ideas that could either, um, traits in the community that could either be supportive of or detrimental to avoiding infection. Um, and those are things like crowded living conditions, transportation habits, dense housing, um, and um, the socio-demographic characteristics that might sort of capture your ability to socially distance. Um, and then we also wanted to identify factors in the neighborhood that had populations with more or fewer risk factors for mortality if infected. And these are things like healthcare access, comorbid conditions, age, gender, and poverty. And we also included indicators of the racial and ethnic makeup of the tract. Um, we, we wanted to be able to separate out deaths that occurred in nursing homes. Um, because it seemed quite likely that those deaths um, were more affected by the, the descriptors of the nursing homes themselves rather than the air quality or other aspects of the neighborhood. 
Um, so, so we separated those out. And um, so there were approximately 1,600 community dwelling adults um, in Chicago that died during the study period. Um, slightly another third of the overall deaths that occurred in Chicago occurred in nursing homes. Um, and sort of of note, the deaths um, that occurred in nursing homes were by virtue of the sample population more likely to occur at a later age and the racial distribution is quite different. Um, we see here the same pattern playing out in, in Chicago that we did nationwide. Um, black residents specifically were dying at a much higher rate. Um, and while the data here um, aren't, aren't put, we saw that non-white residents, um, specifically Hispanic and Latino residents, died at a much earlier age, um, with the mean age of death almost a decade younger than white residents who died. Um, so with the, these this death data, we took two parallel approaches for looking at these uh, associations with air quality. The first that we wanted to do was purely descriptive. Um, we're well aware that confounders matter, but we did want to see sort of, without controlling for other things, is where you, is the air quality going to be associated with death? Um, sort of to understand a little bit how we could compare it to these earlier ones that had to do with, um, with the county level analyses and just sort of to give ourselves sort of a, a sanity check. Um, the second approach was our attempt to control for these track level covariates. Um, so to deal with the correlation, we chose a regularized regression, specifically with an elastic net penalty of all the predictors, um, that should be able to better identify if the pollutants continued to be robustly associated with mortality after controlling for all the other correlated aspects of the neighborhood in which the pollution was. Um, in, I don't know how many of you are familiar, but in these type of regressions, the point estimate for the risk is um, shrunken towards the null. Um, so if the data don't have strong evidence that a pollutant is independently uh, associated with the outcome, it'll shrink it all the way to the null, which in this case would be one. Um, and then the variable is not selected by the model. Um, in these analyses, what you typically do is you conduct several hundred bootstrap replications, and then you report the number of replications in which the variable was selected along with the shrunken effect size of the analysis in the complete set. Um, and there's several rules of thumb, um, but a predictor that's predicted 90% of the bootstrap replications would often be considered of having pretty robust evidence of an association with outcome. Um, so first I'll look at our descriptive results. Um, we did find a correlation between ozone and COVID mortality. Um, but also an inverse association with nitrogen dioxide, which has to do with that um, nonlinear relationship in Chicago between um, nitrogen dioxide or well, between the, the, the two pollutants that Stacey was referring to. Um, so, but that alone really does emphasize the need for analysis that goes beyond um, just the description and controls for the other things that are going on because it if we really did think that they were causally related, then having one that goes in one direction and one that goes in the other would would sort of need to be handled. Um, so here are the results from the regularized regression. Um, given the elastic net penalty, the coefficients aren't directly comparable, um, but you can see that they're all one here. The variables were not selected by the model. Um, and the bootstrap, only in very few of the replications did the model select any of the pollutants. Um, sort of to go over the the other indicators, we found that relatively few characteristics in the neighborhood did have strong evidence for independently affecting COVID-19 mortality. And the neighborhood traits that I circle here in green did have strong evidence or robust evidence that they were associated with the rate of COVID-19 deaths in the neighborhood. Um, so of all the ways that we tried to capture barriers to social distancing in the neighborhood, the one that rose to the top was broadband internet access. Um, we don't know exactly what's going on here. It's possible that this is a proxy for some other kind of flexibility that isn't captured by the variables that, that we had. Um, maybe you could order groceries online or otherwise fill in some of the gaps um, during the spring without, le um, without leaving your home. Um, but that characteristic, particularly internet access, was what seemed to matter the most. Um, health insurance mattered a lot too. Um, neighborhoods where a lot of people were uninsured had worse COVID-19 death rates. Um, we can sort of guess at this mechanism, um, although we need a different type of study to say for sure that without health insurance, if somebody was sick, they might have been able to access good advice about what to do about it, or if they knew what to do about it without health insurance, you, you delayed seeking medical care until the disease had progressed further. Um, and sort of, unfortunately, even though we looked to see if all these other things mattered more, uh, race still mattered a lot with white and Asian neighborhoods seeing lower rates of COVID-19 mortality than um, neighborhoods that were 
um, Black or Hispanic and Latino. Um, so sort of to wrap it up, found really strong evidence for, for the potential for confounding being between pollution and other known built environment risk factors for both infection and mortality. Um, and again, to sort of bring it back to the GIS nature of this, this is not unexpected with public health in, in using geographic data. Um, so I would strongly suggest that people who are pursuing this not look one at uh, one by one on risk factors, just because the likelihood of confounding with other also quite important, but sometimes hard to define um, factors in the built environment is going to be pretty high. Um, I should also sort of note that this isn't like an acceptance of the no. Um, this is still an ecological study, right? Like, so like we're slightly better than the county one, but like still you want to look at individual level data. You're going to want to look at individual hospitalizations where people actually lived before the pandemic. Um, but this, I mean, all of public health is sort of like triangulation of evidence, right? And this is what our, our particular um, evidence is. Um, because from the study, we really did not find strong evidence of dissociation. Um, so yeah, this is this is the the paper that got published. I discusses it a little bit for, further, but um, I think it's time for the discussion. I think that um, Joel uh, Montgomery, if you wanted to unmute yourself um, and, and kick things off. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I was just uh, interested in how the research that you're doing is uh, uh, better than just a simple uh, regression for income, because it seems like you could just do a income regression analysis. Well, um, for one thing, we did look at income as one of the, the many track level co um, covariates, and, and it did not rise to the top in the same way that some of those other risk factors did. So, um, and for another thing, uh, that sort of was that first um, column that I showed you, the, the one by one um, univariate regression. Um, we did look at it to sort of just understand correlations more sort of explicitly, um, but it, it's this uh, between any individual risk factor and, and COVID, but it is the fact that income I mean, in Chicago, you could very easily list off a bunch of other things that also have are plausibly um, causally related to COVID mortality that are associated with the income of your neighborhood. Again, whether your neighbors went to the Alps, um, it could be, um, you know, access to healthcare. So the, the idea of sort of um, elevating income a priori as like the thing that we're most interested in most of the other possibly causally related things that are highly correlated with income, um, that's what the regularized regression can get you closer to. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's specifically designed for heavily correlated variables. And while well, the statisticians would probably freak, pick helping you understand which ones kind of rise to the top. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Dylan and Gage, if you guys wanted to comment about the um, broadband access because yeah I agree that's probably one of the most exciting findings here yeah there was I, I have another thing um, it it got picked up by the press in a way that I had not had other things that I've done research on get picked up by the press before um, and definitely the um, way in which the conclusions were stated were a whole lot more causal than um, we found in the paper but I'm told this is sort of to be expected um, so yeah um, we did tr do our best to control for other things. So we, we looked at the, the age particularly. One thing that's worth stressing is these are all ecological associations. So this would be the broadband access of the neighborhood, which sort of has two effects. One, if you live in a neighborhood with a lot of broadband access, like you yourself, the person who died of COVID, probably had were more likely to have or, le or less likely to have broadband internet. But also we're talking about the built environment that sort of like what living in that milieu does to your risk of COVID. Um, so what we're actually measuring is the broadband access in your neighborhood. Um, so I see in there that, you know, does it reflect our ability to, to work remotely? Almost certainly. We did look at census level estimates, track level estimates of pre-pandemic remote work, um, but sort of as we all know, like 
a lot of people became remote workers during the pandemic who were not would not have answered in, in the American Community Survey in 2018 that they were remote workers. Um, so we ability broadband internet did sort of float to the top above remote work, um, but sort of with the understanding that people who answered remote work in 2018 did not fully capture the people who were working remotely during the pandemic. So yeah, that that risk factor um, persists. I mean, maybe it was your ability to do like dopey Zoom sessions and you didn't get lonely and then go see your friends and then get COVID. Like there's, a, this is not the appropriate, this is the hypothesis generating for like the later um, work. One thing that I think would be interesting would be looking at the effect um, CPS gave out a ton of hotspots at the beginning of the school year to make sure that people, that kids were able to access the remote schooling. Um, I mean, if it were causal, you, you could possibly see a signal in there that neighbor places that, or kids, households that ended up with broadband internet access um, during that second wave of infections that didn't have it in the first, did, did that help reduce your rates? And that's definitely a great question for follow-up research to try to get one, just to know sort of the impacts of the policy, but also to sort of understand the extent to which the broadband internet was causal in, in this particular question. Um, there's, yeah, the, um, we didn't, we couldn't really control for speed. It was, it was a American community survey question about, do you have broadband internet at home? Um, so no, um, it's, it's a pretty broad indicator of, of the, the community's access to it. And Danny, um, Danny, did you want to unmute yourself maybe to make a note about your question or comment? Sure. Hi, sorry, there's a loud air conditioner behind me. Um, and I know this is sort of background into your study, but uh, I've worked a lot over with the national food access studies that are counted, that were anyway county-based. And a lot of, there's been quite a few that are county-based. And I've worried about these same kinds of issues that a lot of them might show Cook County having good food access in the world without really going in and looking at differences. The stuff like, if you just look at the rural counties or between different urban counties, Sort of, yeah. you know, there there is interesting results that can come out of that. So, I was wondering whether you think such county studies perhaps should be like broken up in terms of urban or rural or, or other some other kind of way that might reveal uh, reveal more if you compared different counties that were of similar population, let's say. Yeah, I mean, like sort of these hierarchical models definitely make a lot of sense, right? Like the Census Bureau does a lot of, I mean, you can quibble with it, but like they 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 classify counties in either one to three or, or one to nine ways of like urbanicity. Um, and certainly like the idea is compelling to do things within each of those clusters and then seeing if like there's evidence for heterogeneity and like there almost certainly will be right. Um, the thing that also by looking at the county level things I get like in that like all evidence is triangulation like it's it's good evidence right but like knowing sort of the drawbacks of it are, are important. And one thing that we were particularly worried about given that like these other spatially correlated built environment factors matter. We even we started out looking at all of Cook County and restricted just to Chicago because like the indicator of like do you take a car to work means two different things than if you're living in Lincoln Park than if you're living in Park Ridge right like so even sort of the heterogeneity and what those other risk factors do on top of so like there's definitely something to be said about doing like these grand nationwide things to get like grand nationwide statements but sort of like all politics is local, all risk factors are local too, of <laughs> the built environment particularly. And I would guess with nutrition, it's the same thing too. Like proximity to a farmer's market means a different thing in, you know, normal Illinois than it does here. Um, and, and that was as much of, of a concern too. Thank you. Interesting study. Good answer.
Stacy, I guess I had a question for you. I'll, I'll just read it out. So um, at the start of the pandemic, um, we saw a lot of various researchers from different domains. Because, um, I mean, right now there are so many real-time sensors. You know, outside of the EPA, there is purple air, there is array of things. There's a lot of different kind of citizen science type sensors out there measuring air quality. Um, and there was some work that got some press in Chicago last year for how using, like, for example, um, the pre-deprecated AOT sensors um, that were showing worse air quality after the after the pan or after the pandemic, mm -hmm. as compared to the same week or month in the previous year. Yeah. Um, and they were kind of hypothesizing different health outcomes from that. So, could you comment on kind of best tips or practices to engage when you're working with these types of uh, potentially noisy sensors or, or um, complex models um, yeah. so that we can bring the science forward. Yeah, please do because uh, we would have been uh, lost without y'all. <laughs> yeah, um, I think the biggest like challenge for those kind of studies that initially came out and people were really interested in trying to figure out what was the air quality effects of this shutdown um, was the fact that uh, there's a larger challenge in general where where you need to disentangle the normal meteorological variability that affects these pollutants uh, with like the underlying emissions. And it's really hard to get real emissions data, like the national emissions inventory that I used. I used the 2014 updated 16, but those only come out every like decade or so because it requires so much like counting of everything that's happening. So we're really, we're not that great at getting like real time emissions information. So as a result, people turn to like sensors, which are measuring the environment, uh, but the sensors are measuring the environment. Like the meteorology from any single year can change what you're seeing. Uh, so just comparing like 2018 to 2019 is, you're, you're not necessarily looking at, you might not be able to like, literally say what the change is, uh, you need to be able to contextualize like what's happening with uh, the meteorology, uh, what's happening with the rest of the environment. Um, I don't know if Dan is on this call, uh, or Dan Goldberg, um, but uh, he actually put out a study earlier um, in the pandemic to look at uh, disentangling the way that meteorology and uh, the subsequent concentrations, um, how those things interacted with the onset of the pandemic. Uh, through by looking at um, using satellite observations. So those are like real time observations. And then using a model in which he uh, basically figured out um, what would have happened if it was a normal, uh, if it was just a normal like 2020, um, given what we know about the environment. So you didn't have to, so he didn't have to actually like, you know, make any assumptions about how much traffic changed, how much like our different kind of uh, activities changed. Um, so yeah, I'd say the biggest challenge is like this idea that air quality actually changes on a day-to-day, year-to-year basis. Um, average exposure is better um, related to looking at um, you know longer time segments. Uh, being able to get out average exposure is is it's you need to look at like more 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 and more time. Um, so I think for people who are interested in looking at like, you know, changes in air quality and how that affects people. Uh, like we, a lot of people in my community end up relying on these numerical models that require like a lot of uh, computational power. But in that case, like it's a really good what if question because it does consider these nonlinear uh, uh, things. <laughs> I've never actually talked to you about it. I'm glad I got the details right. Um, but, uh, Anyway, uh, like these uh, chemical transport models actually consider these weird relationships like nitrogen dioxide and ozone. Um, and uh, they can actually kind of give us like, you know, our best estimate what if scenarios. Uh, but you can also, there still is like a lot of utility in using these low cost sensors. But what you have to do is make sure that you contextualize it, bring it back, remember, ground yourself, remember that uh, air quality changes on a day-to-day -day basis, and it might not even be because emissions change, but it might be hotter one day, colder one day, that there might be like, you know, um, a high pressure system and we're just baking over one night. Uh, so you need to be able to look at it more holistically because um, you can still take these point, point source measurements, um, but you can't just say that like, oh, for sure we know that 
today and yesterday are completely different like chemical states because like you know there's carryover and all these kinds of things so yeah i would say um maybe maybe uh it might be helpful like how we did we we all uh linked up in order to discuss what was happening with air quality. What could we call representative? Like, cause I, cause for our model, we only did two months, but like from our side, we've been thinking about what do these two months mean? How does it, uh, how do they fall in the climate? Are these representative, you know? Um, so yeah, that's what I would say is uh, just remember there's a lot of nuance, um, but you can still get uh, some valuable information even with like a lower cost uh, approach. And I, I would sort of say too, like just sort of a plug for, for team science, like as an epidemiologist, I feel like um, we're pretty highly trained to think a lot about outcomes and populations um, and exposure uh, would like most lovely be given to us in a black box that we just say, okay, we don't worry about it. Um, and I would, so making sure that your exposure, your understanding of like, this is like not rocket surgery, but like understanding your exposure matters right because otherwise you're making like new mistakes but like you don't know because you're a noob right like so making sure that all throughout sort of like the epidemiology continuum like the, the population at risk the population that you want to uh, generalize to like understanding that like we don't want to look at nursing home deaths is like something that epidemiologists would think about like a ton and really thinking about like okay you need to have both the summer months and ozone needs to be eight hour max not averaged over the day like that's something that climate scientists think about a ton and it's like again not rocket surgery but kind of hard to do like make sure you have all that knowledge on your team when you start a study because otherwise like drive yourself nuts and make mistakes mm -hmm. yeah and then i think what you end up getting is like uh the all the correlated variables end up canceling each other out uh because you can get meaning out of these things you just need to make sure that you're coming to the analysis with like you know uh a more holistic view I actually see a question from Daniel Block saying, I have a lot of students who would like to do local air quality studies, but feel hamstrung by the low density of monitors in Cook County, especially on the south side. Um, yeah, so I'd say my first project coming into Northwestern has been looking at what are the different kinds of data sets that we can use uh, in order to do this kind of like neighborhood scale analysis. Um, and uh, we, I'd say um, one observational data set that could be uh, useful are using these satellite observations. Um, they're not the like highest resolution. In fact, the uh, the satellite that I showed earlier um, was the Tropomi satellite. It's the newest and highest resolution satellite that we have, uh, or satellite tool that we have, and it's at seven by three and a half kilometers. So you're still getting like you know suburban. Uh, like uh, levels of pollution. And then I, I did additional analysis where I put it onto the one kilometer grid and tried to oversample it in order to like highlight uh, higher polluting sources. Um, but that might be like a little bit too technical, but certainly satellite observations are a great way to even like get like years and years of data. Um, Tropomi is new, but OMI before that, there's, there's like 15 years of data, which is really exciting. So you can actually get, you know, we're, we're talking more about like, you know, long-term exposure and, you know, uh, even at that point we might have a shifting baseline, but that's a different question. Um, and for, uh, but then there's also another low-cost sensor uh, initiative that's uh, pretty well documented and um, relatively trustworthy. That That's the purple air monitors. So I would suggest to look at those um, low-cost sensors. Those are actually like people buy these monitors and then just put them out. Um, so it's it's definitely more of like a citizen science kind of thing. And I've found from working with like the array of things data, which um, those sensors I wouldn't recommend because I believe that they've uh, degraded a lot um, in the environment. Um, it's like a new thing. I don't think, yeah, anyway, don't use array of things data, but the purple air data is uh, more like, you'll be able to get some more information about that. A lot of people use purple air uh, in order to look at these neighborhood scales analysis. Um, and then also like when you're looking at low cost sensors, uh, like the highest thing is like if, we, if you could like, you know, co-locate, figure out, put that sensor or find a sensor that's near a, an EPA monitor, which is like the gold standard of sensing. Um, and then you can actually figure out like how good is your baseline? You know, are they kind of showing the same things? Uh, so that's how I would say it. There are low cost sensors. Purple air is probably a good one. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I, I 
I teach public health GIS, so no question. I always get one or two students who want to do this, want to study air quality, and I'm like, I've always I've often guide them away from it because it feels like the data isn't great. So, yeah. Um, thanks for yeah. those ideas. Yeah, and there are also like other data sets that might be available, like that are like land use regression models, which I know some people use, um, or even like public uh, data sets, like like people who've done modeling studies, like we have at our group. Um, yeah, and I didn't know if I could mention this, <laughs> Marinia, but uh, Marinia is actually coming out with uh, some maps that are higher resolution, kind of like the same resolution that we have, um, that are that give geospatially continuous um, particulate matter. Uh, and uh, so that could be another uh, data set that can work. And just to plug the kind of great connection that's happening here too. So, cause like our team has been doing statistical models at the one kilometer resolution using um, some, some, some of the satellite data is similar, some of it's different um, or from a different satellite product. Um, but one of the goals is, so the statistical models will be less precise than the chemical transport models, but they're not as computationally intense as intensive. So we can look at longer periods of time um, so one of the next goals is to kind of see how the two models um, agree. Um, what's been interesting is that just independently, like the, the general spatial variation looks really similar, um, which, you know, is told, I mean, I, I want to say it's, 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 it's a miracle, it's an accident, but I mean, it, it's also science working um, in, in, you know, in favor of, of these different approaches. So if there's interest, um, our group could present some of that piece, but I think one of the goals here is just to kind of open up the different, you know, to, to break down the barriers between institutions and, and, and also disciplines to kind of connect across these places is going to be pretty great. Okay, we have time for maybe a couple more questions or, you know, closing thoughts or that sort of thing. Um, I, I mean, for those, maybe one question is at the county level, since you guys have spent so much time thinking and like distilling at the local level, you know, at the national level, we still only have county level data for the whole country, right? So if you can make a recommendation from like a methodological standpoint, like how could we, like what are some variables that are missing at the county level that could help, you know, communicate some of those processes? It sounds like having a solid broadband internet variable is going to be important. But um, I don't know if there's other pieces that um, would be helpful as well. One thing that we didn't have, um, which was only available at the county level, um, were these uh, estimates of, uh, well, I don't know. I think the level estimates do sort of what they do. Um, and we sort of, I don't know, demonstrate might be too strong of a causal word, but like in Chicago that the, the local estimates show a different correlation. So at this point, you're probably going to want to move to the individual level data, right? Like you're going to want to know if individual obesity, if individual exposure, if individual um, sort of neighborhood character, because you can append these neighborhood characteristics to individuals too. So then you sort of get at that that multi-layered question about like, is it your your individual income or is it the income of your neighborhood, which then sort of diffuses your neighborhood with like this protective or, or detrimental factors, um, which is a very poetic way to say that. Um, but I would say that you, the county level indicators do what they do. I think if you start pretending that you can really control for individual cat factors with county level covariates, you're probably taking your own estimates a little too seriously. Um, and if that's what you want to do, you should look at individual level data. And from the air quality side of things, um, I would say that a lot of these studies have relied on EPA sensors, which makes sense, it's like the gold standard. It's supposed to be measuring our um, exposure on average. But if you look at the sensor network over the continental United States, you're only getting about one sensor per um, 9,500 kilometers square. So there's a lot of area that's actually not being monitored by EPA sensors, which makes sense because there's a lot of area that isn't really like densely pop populated. But for that kind of um, study, why not? use like a satellite or a different kind of observational tool that provides us that um, spatial resolution. And then you can use, you know, multiple uh, satellites as well, um, measuring the different things. Like Marina, you, I think you had notice in yours, like I've used Probomi, that's good. Um, 
So yeah, I would say there's other data sets that I believe uh, could be utilized. And, and you can also use the EPA sensors, but you know, um, looking at this problem from like the, the multi-dimensional um, air quality side would also be beneficial, I think. And where might regional um, health uh, folks find, like, for example, CMAC models or that sort of thing, right? Like, how could they download? So, so maybe that's just the last point is like how if, if someone's a public health person looking for data, at, I mean, I guess regional scale is probably easier to start with. Like, where would they find that? What kind of data is it? What kind of tools might they need? Um, yeah. Well, 30 seconds or less. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, CMAC is, uh, the EPA has it, so you can download it. It's not that easy to figure out, um, I would say. Uh, yeah. Um, but there are some, uh, like, people who publish, some people are like, you know, uh, it's relatively simple. Like, they'll either literally have it on the website, but these files are so large, um, you might need to email them to get the data. Uh, but I think a lot of people, if you're interested in asking a public health question and they have a high resolution study over your area, I think they'd be so excited. Like I'm writing a model validation paper that's like pretty boring, but it's really exciting that I get to apply it as well. So um, uh, yeah, I think ask the scientists you see posting about this, um, but if you want to get like your PhD uh, in air quality modeling, you know, then you can become proficient in CMAC, I think. <laughs> Which is where, I mean, that sort of does highlight the need for, to some degree, like, there's a trade-off between approachability and rigor, which is a kind of snotty way to say that. Um, there's probably a better way to say that. If you make something easily approachable, then uh, more people get to use it, which is good, but it also means that there's a greater possibility that people who are not, if you don't have this team science idea that you, you know, your whole population and exposure and outcome are all well understood that you're going to make some sort of new mistakes and, and end up with spurious correlations that you get really excited about um, like anybody who's ever taught like an intro to regression course like you see like master students and they get like power drunk they're like oh i know what causes what and that's not true um but i, I would err on the side of like the accessibility of this data matters because like the more people making wrong mistakes means that like good ideas are also going to get through. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and oh, uh, oh Stacy, did you want to note that? Or? Oh yeah, well I, I think that in the beginning when I was speaking about um, asthma, as ozone is like can trigger asthma as well because it's a really severe irritant, but so can nitrogen dioxide. Um, and I believe particulate matter is also related to it. Uh, so all of these are related. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure exactly what the uh, rate is, but Molly says that about ozone and particulate matter are about the same for um, inducing asthma. So. Uh, that's so nitrogen dioxide is sort of used as a proxy of traffic related pollution, which means a lot of other things. So uh, nitrogen dioxide is less clear evidence, not unclear, but like less strong than actually being like the thing that does it as opposed to being like an indicator of traffic. Mm -hmm. Which is a gross oversimplification. Okay, thank you guys um, all. We'll be sure to share the recording um, through the listserv. And then um, we may be taking a summer break. Um, that's there's a there there are there are traditions of that in the public health GIS network. Um, but just let us know if there is a topic you would like to present on. We're always open to that, and we've had a lot of folks outside of Chicago present to the network as, as well. So I've seen a lot of folks on here outside of Chicago. So please don't be, you know, um, nervous about that. But thanks. Feel free to like unmute and clap, or you can. Um, put you know put out the icons <laughs> as well. Um, but this is an it was an awesome presentation, but also discussion. So thank you guys.